Good morning, everybody. Uh, for those of you who are at Bill Mueller's session yesterday morning, you saw some incredibly uh, fascinating uh, retinal cases. Uh, unfortunately, those are cases that most of us will never see in a lifetime of, of doing retina. This session, we're going to show you some cases that I can guarantee you will see, sometimes on a monthly basis, and they have pathognomonic imaging findings that you don't want to miss. I'd like to introduce my panel, uh, Brandon Lujan, Mike Yip, Phil Rosenfeld, and Su Young Yu. Uh, neither the panel nor I have any financial interest that's relevant to these cases. So Ursula just told us that ancillary testing is the most important thing in retina. I don't disagree. And I think we probably agree that OCT right now is the most useful ancillary test that we have. For those of us who don't have AI or machine learning, we're dependent on pattern recognition, which is the ability to immediately recognize abnormalities. And of course, in order to recognize abnormalities, you have to know what normal is. And I highly recommend this paper uh, by Starengian colleagues, uh, which is the international nomenclature for normal OCT. So let's start with case one. Phil, why don't you kick us off? This is a structural cross-section OCT. What's wrong with this image? Well, I think Elaine Galtrick just gave us a wonderful talk on various causes of cystic changes in the central macular region. And this case has some pathognomonic findings. One is that there's this draping of the internal limiting membrane over a central cavity. There's some cystic changes in the mid-retinal region. And then you have this outer retinal cavity, which uh, is on the temporal aspect of the fovea. And this is pretty characteristic for macular telangiectasia type 2, though there are other conditions such as tamoxifen maculopathy can have a similar appearance. In but this to, situation, would you get any other ancillary testing? Or are you sure enough about the diagnosis? Well, right now, I would routinely have performed OCT angiography, which gives us the pathognomonic tangled um, deranged vessels that are located just temporal to the fo fovea, and I would imagine are present in this case. And Phil is correct. This is MACTEL2. And here are some of those ancillary tests. And Phil, again, uh, autofluorescence, helpful, yes or no. Fluorescein, yes or no. And there's your OCT angiography showing that typical tangled vessel. So this is a quick differential. You mentioned tamoxifen. Uh, and I think there's a couple other things we should consider, but this is uh, pathognomonic, I think, of MACTEL2. Uh, Sun, could you take a look at this OCT, right eye, and I'm going to show you the left eye as well, and you have the advantage of seeing the uh, macular uh, scans as well to look at the thickness maps. Okay. I so, mm -hmm. what's wrong with these OCTs? I see some uh, increased reflectivity uh, on the nerve fiber layer and then the uh, plexiform layer also. And then there's some loss of uh, the, um, there's a space uh, uh, expansion of under the uh, outer, outer retinal layer. And then I don't see any thickness change on the thickness map. So uh, is this pathognomonic for any diagnosis? Uh, I don't get any. And how about additional testing? What else would you like to see? So I would like to have um, fundus orofluorescence and OCT and geography. So the characteristics of this zonal thinning of the outer nuclear layer are there, and I think you can also see that on the maps. Jake, can we just point out that you know, the, this, this uh, off-axis image shows Henley's fiber layer very it clearly, does. and that's the hyperreflectivity that was referred to. It does demonstrate that the outer nuclear layer is thinner there, as well as really points out that those areas of easy So due to the tilt, you can see Henley's layer. But clearly, our eye may not pick it up right away, but if the, if the maps are correct, you can see this perifoveal or thinning. And that is characteristic of Plaquenil. For those of you in the audience who take a history, you would have known this patient was on Plaquenil, but I did not give you that history. But she was. There is her fluorescein. Helpful yes or no, panel? No, no not a helpful test. And there's the autofluorescence, which does so show, I think, subtle changes. Should we be getting OCT and autofluorescence, or is OCT enough? OCT is enough. If I had to choose one, I'd take OCT. Yes. I'd pick OCT. And how about treatment? Can we treat this disease? 
Stop the drug cessation. Got to stop the drug, and you should have a very low threshold for stopping the drug. Okay, Mike, you're up for this one. Cross-sectional OCT, I gave you the visual acuity. What's wrong with this OCT? Um, uh, let's do some additional testing. The vision's 20, 2080. Um, uh, I do see maybe a little bit of easy, att uh, easy attenuation. There's uh, a little bit left there underneath the central foveal area, but it's quite a bit attenuated uh, in the parafoveal uh, region. It sure is. Anything else? Panel? There are these lumpity bumpities on the R RPE deposits. A little bit of, yeah, so there, there are some um, uh, sort of, yeah, lumps on, on the uh, RPE. And is this pathognomonic? I don't see anything pathognomonic yet. There's a, a pertinent well, negative is that there's no uh, choroidal hyperreflectivity or hypertransmission. And what would that show if there was choroidal transmission? It would, it would change your, your thinking if it's a photoreceptor mediated process purely or if it's also an RPE mediated process. So between the vitreous inflammation and this diffuse outer retinal loss that Mike pointed out, what's the diagnosis? Well, <clears throat> I would love to see what the choreocapillaris looks like in this case. Well, you're not going to get to see that. This is pathognomonic, I think, of, of syphilis, that combination of the diffuse outer retinal loss and the vitreous inflammation. And of course, had you looked in the eye first and not looked at the OCT first, I think you would have seen the panuveitis. But that combination of zonal or diffuse outer retinal loss, you can see it in syphilis, mutes, and jetrea, or acroplasmin. And that's recoverable in all of these, remarkably. But of course, we have outer retinal loss that's not recoverable. Uh, Brandon. I call this case gestalt because we like to focus on the outer retina and the choroid, but sometimes you have to look at the whole scan. What's wrong? Yeah, so this case draws attention to not what's positive and what's abnormal there, but what's missing. Um, so I think th this case, it's, once you see it, it's obvious, but it's not always hitting you over the head, but the nerve fiber layer and ganglion cell layer is completely absent in that eye. So you see the vitreous, that's a bit of a confounder, but that's, that's not the normal hyperreflectivity of NFL at all. And I think if we were in a room full of glaucoma specialists, we might have noticed that right away. But this reminds you to look at the whole scan. So is this pathognomonic, or is there additional testing we ought to get? Uh, definitely additional testing. This, what do you recommend? Yeah, so you can start with, with some uh, retinal imaging, never a bad idea. Helpful, yes or no? Uh, the optic nerve in the left looks pretty pale, as does the one in the right, but uh, the, the, the fluorescein and the fundus autofluorescence are not helpful. And so what's next? Oh, you got to scan. you got to do an MRI. Well, just to remind you, you have a very powerful instrument sitting in front of you, which is the OCT, and unexplained visual loss on a retinal nature, I think, should always prompt a look at the optic nerves. And if you have programs to look at the ganglion cells, what's really interesting is in a similar eye, the left eye, you can actually see the temporal thinning, which would be backed up by the visual field onto the scan, which shows a brain tumor. Not to be missed. Okay, Phil, you're up again. Case five, 2200 vision. What's wrong? And is this pathognomonic and any additional testing? Well, what jumps out at me in this case is the, um, the shaggy photoreceptors under the central foveal region, the loss of the outer nuclear layer, but you also have what appears to be, it's called a double layer sign, where you have an elevation of the RPE separating it from Brooks mem membrane. Some people call that a shallow, irregular RPE elevation. That's Robin Geimer's term, which is very attractive. And it's a, uh, basically representative of what most of us think is a type 1 neovascular complex. Do you think this choroid is thickened above the 95 percentile? <laughs> it's probably not. <laughs> Ooh, OK. Uh, double layer sign, flat irregular RPED, subretinal fluid, Mm. Some of us might think it's thickened, and that's VMA, is vitromacro adhesion. Is that pathologic, Phil? What, the VMA? Yeah. Uh, I'd say that's an ancillary finding. Yes. So is this a type 1 CNV, guaranteed, 100%? Well, what makes me think that this is related to another process other than AMD is the fact that you've got those photoreceptor loss there 
which means there's probably been chronic fluid, not usually consistent with AMD. So this could be at one point a central series related neovascular complex. That's exactly what the diagnosis was. This patient did have a long history of central serous. And the OCTA, does that show in your mind that this eye is now vascularized? Well, there is flow. There's a flow signature between Brooks' membrane and the RP. And there's the Onfoss. Convinced? Yes. Panel? Do we treat or watch? And if so, with what? Anti VEGF, PDT? Both? Anti-VEGF. Sure Anti-VEGF. Everybody agree? For sure. yes. yes. Okay. Sunk, uh, you're going to have the next case. And I'll start out by asking you, what's wrong with this OCT, and is this pathognomonic? Yes, I see uh, subretinal fluid and an outer segment and easy elongation, and I see some PED with the internal reflectivity and some uh, increased reflectivity from the RPE. I think this can be um, a polypoidal lesion. So any other possibilities other than polypoidal? Uh, I think uh, it can be a uh, type 1 CMB, but it's more look like a uh, polypoidal. In, in your experience, can you diagnose polypoidal just from this scan, or do we need to do ICG as well? So at this moment, um, yes, the ICGA. And is an OCTA helpful? Yes. So here are the features, that sharp RPED, subretinal fluid. Phil, is that a thickened choroid? I don't know. You're going to have to I show me a scan we, that shows me the I don't have your software. Analogy. I'm calling it a thickened choroid. Uh, and multiple RPDs with this very distinctive hypo-reflective lumen along with hard exudate, these are all features of polypoidal cortical vasculopathy or type 1 aneurysmal yeah, vascularization. Yeah, like there's a nice double layer sign, too. And there's the OCTA. Song, is this helpful? Yes, this is greatly helpful. I see uh, hyperflow signal as a dot, so it's uh, related correspond to the uh, PED area. So I think this is polypoidalism. And with these two images, the OCT, OCTA, again, I'd ask, do we all have to be doing ICG, or have we confirmed the diagnosis? No, I think this is diagnostic. And there is the fluorescein on the top and the ICG on the bottom showing the polyps very nicely. And I guess the question to the panel is, does it matter? If we all agree this eye's vascularized, does it matter whether it's PCV or t another type of neovascularization? Brandon, what do you think? Does it make a difference? Does, are you going to treat this patient any differently? Um, I, I would probably not treat them differently. I would, I would treat with uh, anti-VEGF as well in this situation. And I, I'm drawn by the similarity between this and the previous case of, of um, the CSCR with CNB. And uh, obviously the difference is the polyp you're seeing on the OCTA, but yes, they're going to get Well, Phil, Phil may argue with me, but I do think they were both pachychorid cases. All right, on to case seven. Mike, I'm going to show you a right eye and a very similar looking left eye and ask you the question, what's wrong? Well, there's obviously, um, uh, under, under the fovea, there are these um, sort of vitelliform or uh, elevated lesions. Uh, are these pathognomonic of a disorder? And do you need to see any additional testing? Not, nothing pathognomonic is coming up at this. So time. we've got these bilaminar, bilateral, solid appearing RPEDs, that bilaminar nature, does that strike anybody as characteristic of pattern dystrophy, adult onset vitelliform? Any other testing you need to see to confirm that diagnosis? Fundus photographs, always helpful. Autofluorescence. There's great. the autofluorescence. What are the characteristics that tell you this is pattern and not bests? Any? Can you tell just from the testing? Do we need EOGs? Do we need genetics? Well, EOG would be, would be helpful if you want to prove bests. Well, it's an imaging conference, so you don't get an EOG. <laughs> right. But I will ask you, how do you know these lesions aren't vascularized? Any particular tests be helpful? I think an OCTA would be helpful. Oh, and there's the OCTA, the chorea capillaris. 
So, Brandon, you get the last case. This looks very familiar, doesn't it? Bilaminar, solid-looking PED in the right eye. I'm sorry, left eye. But look at the right eye. It looks a little different. What do you see that's abnormal? Uh, so this is a vertical OCT. You can see the nerve fiber layer on both sides. You see this um, subretinal fluid pocket on the right and this um, area of hyperreflectivity and atrophy uh, there on the left. Can you get neovascularization and panor dystrophy? Yes. You absolutely. sure can. And what tests would you like to see to confirm it? Well, I think in this conference, Jay, with you and OCTA would be great. There it is. So we're out of time. Thank you very much. Panel, you did a great job. Thanks for your attention. <laughs>